Hello, I'm Dr. Ian Miles. We're going to talk to you today about our research that goes by a big fancy title, but I'm just going to call it Eczema Comes from Air Pollution. Now, since I'm an academic, I'm required to stick a little probably there on the end, but allow me to state my case. Like most industrialist countries in the United States, the rates of eczema have really exploded in modern times. And when people have asked, like, well, what could be causing eczema, genetics is always what they tend to blame first. But the rates in pre-industrial times or non-industrialized societies are maybe 1% to 3% of kids at most. Um, and yet today in America, we're looking at something like 15% and other countries up to 25 Certain parts of the country are that high. Um, so yes, genetics might play some role, but there's no since they haven't shifted substantially since pre-industrial era, they would only be expected to have as much as a role then. So they can't possibly explain this modern rise. So if something went wrong with our kids in the 1970s, it's definitely something out of the environment that did so. The potential environmental exposures that have been linked to eczema can fit into one of four groups, I would say. First is living in an industrialized area where processed foods and antibiotic exposure can be problematic. But moving to the United States or EU from a non-industrial part of the world before year two carries a risk. You can move after your six, you move wherever you want, and your risk doesn't change, suggesting there's some kind of early life window that matters. Inside the United States, there's an additional risk for living in an urban environment versus rural. Most of the time when you talk about urban living as an environmental exposure, you're talking about automobile exhaust, um, evidenced by the fact that if you're pregnant right near a highway, the chances your child will have eczema will basically double. But most of the common or the most um, substantive components of uh, automobile exhaust don't really have anywhere near the same level of association. And importantly, they've mostly been going down since the 1970s. This graph is from the 90s, but you know there's been a substantial reduction in these particular type of pollutants. Um, wildfires were just put on the map by uh, Maria Way in San Francisco, who really showed not only that it can influence the rates of eczema, but can induce flares in the surrounding community. The last category would be things that you would just put into your home. Patients have problems with certain fabrics like nylon, spandex, and polyester. Um, tobacco smoke makes everything worse. Um, and then problems with new floor, paint, polyurethane, sealants, foam mattresses, um, wallpaper, glue, so forth. But again, early exposure seems to matter. Um, exposure later on in life does not. So to look at this, um, Jordan Zeldin, a med student in the lab, he combined two different databases. The first would allow you to know what are the eczema hotspots in the United States, and then contrast that with the EPA database, which would say what chemicals are more common in eczema hotspots. And we didn't know what we'd find, and at the start, I'll be honest, I told him, hey, don't worry if the results are messy. I doubt we're going to have an Aaron Brockovich moment, um, obviously referencing the author, activist, and inspiration for her own biopic film. Um, but we didn't know what to look at, so we put these two things together. And using various mathematical tools, we're only showing you one. There's one thing kind of left out um, that was the greatest predictor of whether or not people in your zip code were end up going to go to the doctor um, for eczema, and that would be diisocyanates. You want to know what those are? They're basically the chemistry is a nitrogen double bonded to a carbon, then to an oxygen. If there's two on the molecule, they're diisocyanates. If there's just one, then it's an isocyanate. No! Okay, what does this actually mean to you? Why do you care? Well, I told you living in an urban environment in an industrialized country mattered. Well, in the industrialized sectors, even though diisocyanates were invented in the late 40s, they weren't really manufactured in earnest in the United States until the 70s, and particularly this one called TDI, which is the most common one. Um, living near a highway would expose yourself to those isocyanates because those come out of the back of an automobile, but only an automobile that has a catalytic converter. Catalytic converters are the reason why all those other chemicals are going down. As an, as an unintended consequence, they produce isocyanates. Catalytic converters were required in the United States starting in 1975. There is only one major natural source of isocyanates in the wild, and that would indeed be wildfires. How you might bring this into your home, diisocyanates are made into nylon, spandex, polyester. They are used for paints, wood sealant, uh, foam mattresses, wallpaper glue. Isocyanates, like every other toxic chemical in the universe, are in tobacco smoke. But to go beyond correlation, we wanted to see how this might be happening. So we took advantage of the fact that your skin is coated with millions of microorganisms, and you can kind of envision it to be like Richard Scarry's busy town. 
Um, when you can start to characterize what types of animals live there, you can be more and more specific down to the different species, all the way down to what we would call isolate level identification, where you'd say, here is Loli the worm and Huckle the cat specifically. Um, but as the microbiome has um, been researched further, you started to get into why it's living on the skin. What are their roles? Um, what jobs does it have? Because if you really need somebody to be a horn player, you can't just grab any old pig off the street. The scary town for your skin would look something like this. There's a lot of attention paid to Staph aureus because it can create a lot of problems through a host of different mechanisms to make the disease worse. One thing that is really important to stress is that staph is contagious and eczema is absolutely not. So staph can make the disease worse, but it cannot make the disease because the disease is unequivocally not contagious. So attention is turned to some of these other organisms to see what their jobs are. Now some of them, their role is to help protect staph from coming in and making things worse. That's good. Um, but some of these uh, coag negative staph in a bacteria that we work on called Rosimonas mucosa, they're really around lipid biology. You might think of it as the oils in your skin. So the good kinds of staph um, might make steroids and vitamin D. Both of those um, are derived from cholesterol. Um, Rosimonas and staph epi will help either your body make or they'll make on their own these ceramides. Ceramides you can find at your grocery store, some lotion bragging about having ceramides in it because it has beneficial properties on the skin. So these bacteria are making it for you. So these are the organisms that live there and this is kind of their job is around lipid metabolism. So we can use that then in two ways. The question is, could these bacteria be the canary in the coal mine? So if they're poisoned off or if they can't do their job around these certain toxins, that might be a sign that that toxin is a problem. The second question could be, do the microbiome replacement therapy help, like probiotics? I'll put a link down below to different options for probiotics. If anybody actually watches this, maybe we'll make a specific video based on the probiotic treatment. The short answer is yes, replacing your microbiome with probiotics can be very helpful, but we're going to focus today on using these things to tease apart the environment. So these are photos of different kinds of bacteria on the plate. This is the Rosimonas that we might have used as a topical probiotic in our trial versus one that you could take from a patient with eczema versus normal situations. This is how much they grow. And then if you expose them to that TDI, they start to die off. You can see substantially so in the healthy version, somewhat in the disease version, but the disease associated isolates are better adapted at survival. We see the same thing in those Staphylococcus species, the good form of Staph, so to speak, gets killed off by these toxins and Staph aureus is basically laughing at it. I don't want to get into the nuts and bolts of this, but the short version is for a bacteria like Rosiomonas, it's actually making these beneficial lipids for you out of thin air. It takes nitrogen and carbon dioxide, turns it into these lipids, and then those lipids get made into the ceramides that protect your skin. Staph epi, Staph coni, these kinds of organisms also help make steroids and ceramides. All of these are blocked by isocyanate and diisocyanate. You can actually watch this happen for Rosiomonas. You can see here as this red line, as the amount of diisocyanate exposure goes up, that red line is the ceramide saying that its production goes down, even though this black line here is how much it grows. So the bacteria can metabolize this toxin and can, it can grow better, but it starts to behave worse. In order to survive isocyanate exposure, it shifts its physiology away from these beneficial lipids towards antioxidants that it's making, such as lysine, which is a trick that Staph aureus has also figured out. And so it's got to choose between the two. And the best way that I could think to show this is if you're a bacteria that has been exposed to these particular toxins. You either die a hero or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. And it gets worse in the sense that these, these toxins can directly activate itch receptors on the skin. So these are nerve cells exposed to TDI. You can watch how they light up, which means they're being activated. And those would send signals to the brain for itch, and the brain would send a signal back for rash and inflammation. Can't do it if you block this particular receptor. In mice, you can actually use TDI topically on the ear and you can give a mouse eczema using diisocyanates. Uh, so in the normal mice, you see these, this inflammation that appears and then the, in the receptor knockout mice, you don't. So this means that you can potentially block this as a therapy. And we've done that to, uh, you know, as added benefit to the probiotics, which again, we can discuss at other times. However, as exciting as it might be to have therapeutic properties. Job's not finished. Job finished? I don't think so.
Okay. Because treatment is great. It's great to know that you can refresh your bacteria. It's great that we might be able to block these receptors on the skin, but obviously it wouldn't prevent the toxin from corrupting your new bacteria. Because really what you would want is to be able to avoid this and not rely on a medication. The problem is the best detection systems human have ever made is about a hundred fold worse at detecting isocyanates than the bacteria on your skin. So we need to invent an entire new way to track this because we need to have something that could show us how much it changes over time or place and use that information in three ways. First would be to contrast the fluctuations in the pollutants to data from these kind of trackers like eczema tracker or eczema wise where patients put in their information and it would tell you if one patient's having a flare, are their neighbors potentially having a flare? Or if they're having a flare that they think is unpredictable, that they couldn't figure out a reason why, might you be able to predict it by seeing a spike in these particular pollutants before those flares kicked off in the surrounding community? The second thing is to work with some of these um, companies to figure out which products are actually safe. And this does distinguish it from the Aaron Brockovich moment because the manufacturers that make diisocyanates in these products, they know that these things are toxic and have actually worked with researchers in the past um, to protect people's lungs from some of the asthma um, problems. And there's really very little reason to suspect that they knew all this and would be keeping it secret. So some products will be safer than others, some brands will be safer than others, maybe shifts in the manufacturing or longer off-gassing time and so forth. The overall goal being to help consumers make a wiser decision. And because the car exhaust and wildfires are still gonna be a problem, the long-term goal would also be air filters. So there's a ton of air filters on the market, but we don't really know which ones specifically will guarantee that they'll pull this stuff um, out, of this, out of your air. And so with these kind of trackers, you'd be able to really address what I'm gonna to refer to as the shared environment fallacy. This idea that just because, you know, hey, we are living on the same streets, so we're all drinking the same water, we're all breathing the same air. Um, and so therefore, if your kid got eczema and your neighbor's kid didn't, well, it's because your kid is just inherently biologically flawed, as if the eczema was guaranteed at conception. And, you know, when you really think about the environment, ask yourself, is it static? Is it just one thing or is there variation and fluctuation over time and space? Is there differences between the parts of the room you might be watching this in? And for an example, I'll use the lead water um, contamination crisis in Flint, Michigan. Do you think it was the lead was just static or were there big fluctuations um, over time? You could see pictures of the variation of just the sediment alone. People's water exposure is going to be variable. You don't take a shower all day long. Sometimes you drink water, sometimes you don't. And your susceptibility is gonna be different. Adults are not gonna have growth stunting from lead, but kids, particularly ones going through a growth spurt, whether that be a physical growth spurt or a neurologic growth spurt, would be particularly susceptible to the growth stunting or the neurologic damage caused by lead. So kids that drank a lot of water at just the wrong time um, would be at greater risk than somebody maybe two hours later who had lower lead levels or who decided to have a juice box instead. As it might relate to eczema, you can envision a kid out there at the park wearing polyester with the wind blowing across these factories and across a crowded highway and all of an hour later, a kid might be out there wearing cotton with the winds having shifted and traffic having died down. You know, so the, the reality is from a molecular basis, the exact same spot um, can have wildly different environments and it's time that maybe research start acting like that. Because I know we covered a lot, let me just review real quick. We went asking the questions, which particular chemicals tend to hang around the clinics that are seeing the most eczema? And we found that isocyanate containing chemicals are the ones that are most frequently found in that area. They became on the market in earnest and became part of car exhaust immediately prior to the modern rise in eczema in the United States. It's a component of multiple exposures linked to eczema, everything ranging from fabrics, foams, and adhesives to wildfires and cigarette smoke. In the lab, we can show that isocyanates can corrupt your skin's healthy bacteria. We can use them intentionally to give mice eczema, and we can find that they directly activate the itch on the skin. All right, well, thank you for your attention. Like I said, I'll put a link down below to the paper if you want to read all the gory details. Um, if there are any probiotic companies that want to manufacture this um, on behalf of the public, we'll put that down there. Um, if anybody actually watches this, um, we can make one for the probiotics um, specifically. 
and hopefully make another one in the future with a successful update for having created a better detection system um, that could really answer some of the remaining questions. Thank you again.